we're pretty lucky to have Dr. Chris Duncan from UNSW speaking. Um, he's a, a mathematical psychologist. He does a lot of work in, um, uh, it, it's categorized in my mind as vision stuff, which is probably not fair. <laughs> Um, uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, lots of cool smart vision stuff and decision making, um, but as a sort of part of that, he's sort of thought very extensively about um, uh, science and meta-science issues and particularly the role of theory and modeling and uh, pre-registration in science. So that's what he'll be talking about us today. Everyone, um, give Chris a round of applause. Um, the way we'll, 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 the way we'll work this is um, uh, if you have questions during the talk, please put them in chat. Um, if they're super, like uh, I, I might elevate some to him in the middle of the talk, but we'll probably save most of them towards the end. And um, and then you can ask, uh, you know, either out of chat or your questions verbally at the end. All right. So go ahead. Over to you, Chris. And thanks, thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, so, and thank you to anyone that makes it today, especially given that you could be outside, like two weeks ago, at least you had no excuse not to be at the talk. Um, but uh, yeah, the, thanks also, I guess, to anyone that, that comes to this talk already disagreeing um, or not expecting to agree with what I say, uh, but it's very much appreciated that you just Chris, you've muted yourself. Oh, you. Said someone else muted me, <laughs> which is fair enough. I'm terrible. <laughs> that was an accident. I was trying to let somebody in, and then the person was let in, and my mouse moved over you. So that one. Oh, it's all good. We'll um, use that periodically through the talk to make it. <laughs> just yeah. it's a, it's the gauntlet. All right. All right. So. Um, yeah, it's very much appreciated to take the time to to I guess try and understand why um, why a collection of people would would find problems with something that just seems so good like pre-registration I think has it just seems like it should be a good thing or a force for good so why why would people disagree with it and I, I the title of the talk and the paper is is pre is pre-registration worthwhile um, that title obviously is a change from a, a far more controversial one which we didn't argue for in the letter it was a silly title um, it's changed is pre-registration worthwhile because that's a reply to a, an original paper. But I, again, I still don't like this title because I think if you think pre-registration is worthwhile, then great, do it. Um, the really the, 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 the argument I think I want to try and make is that is it, is it something that deserves the elevated status or elevated opinion that it has where um, you know, people talk it along, uh, talk about it alongside other really useful, important open science things like open data, reproducible methods, um, important, generally, arguably important things. Um, peer registration is considered up there. It's, it, people care about it on granting bodies and hiring committees and journals and so on. And I don't think it has, there are good arguments for why it deserves that such an elevated status. I think it could be personally useful, so it could be personally worthwhile. I'm just not sure there's a good argument for why it exists in sort of, sort of um, yeah, that higher status. And so the, there we go. What, what I'm going to spend most of the time talking about in this talk is, is about pre-registration as a way of, of, or the effects of pre-registration on your ability to make good scientific claims or good tests of, of theories. And the question is basically should, it doesn't make any sense to say, um, look, I really wish they'd have pre-registered that study because then I could, then I'd believe what they're saying. Or um, is there any benefit to pre-registering aims, methods, results, or anal uh, intended analyses um, in the context of testing theories? And so most of this talk is gonna be on the very strong argument in favor of that, which is about the distinction between confirmatory, exploratory analyses I'm going to try and make the claim that that's, that's largely irrelevant for the testing of theory. But before we get into that, there is, there's a whole bunch of other stuff about pre-registration that's worth talking about in advance. Um, and these are other arguments that are, are basically in favor of, of pre-registration and why, they're, that why we might expect it to be a useful thing. I think these are some, sometimes good. So for example, the, the nudge argument, the idea that when you pre-register, being encouraged to think about the aims, the methods, the intended analyses might improve studies because you might find problems with what you're going to do upon deeper consideration. 
and then you might change the design in advance of that and that might lead to a better study. And that argument is that that seems fair enough, right? But it's not a general argument. It already presupposes that the, the things by which you judge good research or that you are capable of understanding what it is that makes a study good and useful are already inside the head of people that are, that are making these decisions that are designing studies, right? And so the argument must be that, that you people are just rushed and they're too rushed and that's why the studies are ending up bad. And I don't think that's a, that's a completely true. We are rushed, of course, but I don't think that's a complete explanation of, of, um, of why studies are, are, are not ideal or are not great sometimes. Um, and I don't think that just more helping is important, but better help, better, better thinking, or more, more thinking is important. Better thinking is also necessary. We need education, not just more uh, incentives to think more about what we're doing. But again, right, do whatever helps you. The, the, if you think pre-registration is worthwhile and that it does improve the studies that you're doing, great, do it, right? Um, but again, I think understand that that's not a good argument for why everyone should be doing it or why granting agencies should care about it, right? I, I think best when I take long walks. If I have to make a talk, if I have to write a paper, I take a long walk and think through things. But there's no reason, of course, to think that long walks are a predictor of good science. We shouldn't ask other people to do it. Granting agencies shouldn't care whether people are taking long walks. And I think that's a reasonable enough analogy um, to pre-registration. It obviously falls short in some point, but not in important ways, I don't think. So I don't, I don't think the nudge argument is good enough to elevate pre-registration to a heightened status of importance. I think there's something similar about transparency too. So I think one of the obvious benefits of pre-registration is that it makes things transparent, right? By forcing people or encouraging people to write down ahead of time what conditions that they're going to run, what analyses they're going to um, perform, what dependent variables they're going to collect and so on. Being transparent about that stuff is obviously important because it, there is a very clear general argument for why we need to know what was done. If, you, if it's deemed theoretically relevant, then at, at the outset of a study, then it might remain theoretically relevant later on. Um, and so transparency about those things uh, is important. But I don't think there's a general argument for why transparency in when people have their thoughts or have their plans is important, right? Like there's not, at least with respect to the evaluation and testing of theories. Um, there are, I think, clear sort of pedagogical benefits perhaps to, to writing down what you think will happen or what you think your theory says will happen um, today because there might be lessons to learn from later saying like, oh, interesting. I used to think that this would happen and today I don't think that that's true anymore. I, I've learned something, right? Like keeping a diary is a useful process. But again, I don't think that's the same as arguing that it would necessarily improve science, generally speaking, right? And so again, I don't think it meets that criterion of something that would elevate it to some um, important status alongside things like transparency in data, um, right? And so I think what we have to focus on and have policies around are the transparency and what, what, is, what matters or what seems relevant, uh, generally speaking. <coughs> and so, the, these sort of, I think these are good arguments for why pre-registration can be useful, like within a lab context, within a workflow, um, because in, encouraging thinking, encouraging transparency is, is obviously good. Um, but that's not all of what pre-registration is about, right? I think pre-registration is, is, has, has received the sort of um, buy-in that it has because it's a solution to a problem that we've identified, right? We, we see behaviors that are problematic, such as harking, p-hacking, and so on. And we attribute the problem in those behaviors to the failure to distinguish between a confirmatory and an exploratory analysis. And then pre-registration is the solution to that problem of not distinguishing between the two. Once you pre-register, now it's clear what was planned and what wasn't planned. And we can look at things like the wonderful 2011 Simmons et al. paper where they show that if you listen to the Beatles, you, you become younger. Um, and they do these wonderful simulation studies showing that researcher degrees of freedom can be exploited by people um, to create p-values that are less than 0.05 with surprising ease, right? And that we then take from that lesson, from that paper, from that simulation study, we take the lesson that 
confirmatory statistical uh, statistical analyses are what we need because they're they're more trustworthy. They'll yield more replicable results because you'll do things like control the type one error rate that went out of control in those simulations. We'll ensure that the sampling distributions of test statistics are preserved. We avoid overfitting. We avoid the bias that's injected by the researcher when they they perform analyses to suit their mean their their needs. And as a result, we protect that statistical inference. We create p-values that, that are better when they come from confirmatory analyses than exploratory analyses. And that, that's, I think that's what pre-registration, the strong argument for pre-registration, why you would lift it to some higher elevated status is because it would solve this kind of problem. Right. But the whole, what I'm gonna try and do for most of this talk is, is try and convince you that, that the theoretical reason within the machinery of statistics that says the distinction between confirmatory and exploratory research um, and the clear arguments for why that's the case within the theory of statistics don't translate into scientific practice. And so that when it comes to the question of do theory, how do we test theories, what's important when we're deciding whether a theory is good or bad or whether we have a good or bad explanation for something, the distinction between confirmatory and exploratory research stops mattering. And it sort of makes sense that it would because to assume that when something is said is important for whether it's true just doesn't seem to have any value. It seems to imply that when you say something matters and it has a causal effect on, on the truth of something, right? Like Einstein could appear today, say the same things he said um, years ago, decades ago, and it wouldn't change the quality of those arguments. Right? Um, I also like thinking like if science is the process of coming up with good explanations, what are other situations where humans use and rely on good explanations or good arguments? And I was thinking this is, this is a little bit, little bit silly, but I've, you never see defense lawyers saying that to the, the prosecution's arguments, there's reasonable doubt here because the prosecution's arguments are all post hoc. They're all harking. All of these things were happened after the crime was committed, right? That you'd never see that argument, which is, it's just, I just think is a funny, a funny little observation. The, the, the real point here is that I think the distinction between confirmatory and exploratory analysis is a heuristic that's motivated by theories of statistical inference. And that just, that heuristic fails to translate well into how we do science and how we test theories and how we um, advance knowledge. And so I'm just going to have to ask you now for this slide, just to just to pretend like I can convince you of that, right? Take take it like the next 25 minutes of the talk, you walk away saying like, okay, I'll look into this a little bit more. And this because what I think I need is this slide to try and say why we we are why in the original title for this letter we put pre-registration is redundant at best. And as people very quickly pointed out, and rightly so, you don't say anything about at best. Why are you saying that this could be harmful? This doesn't make any sense. You don't say that in the letter at all. It's true. But here's why I think at best is an okay thing to say. And I think it's when we published this this um, preprint and the internet exploded you know, a little microcosm of the internet, tiny little microcosm of the internet exploded. Um, what was amazing was everyone seemed to have their own very nuanced reason for why pre-registration was useful. It's not about that, it's about this. And that's fine, that's a good reason again for you to have your own in-house policy about pre-registration. Um, but what people seem to do was agree that there are problems and they disagreed on what those problems were and I think what will happen over time if we start to take pre-registration seriously, have it have that elevated status, is that the nuance in that understanding starts to get lost as we teach the theory of pre-registration. I think that takes over. I think we've seen that actually happen in other cases in psychology, right? Null hypothesis significance testing. My guess is that the people using that, proposing that that's how we should do things, knew the problems inherent to that system. And yet what happens over time is the nuance in that understanding gets lost and we end up taking too seriously the concepts in those, in those theoretical frameworks. And I think this, we, we, there is no reason not to expect that to happen with pre-registration. And that would be a shame because as I'll try and argue is that pre-registration misdiagnoses the real problems that cause crises of confidence, confidence, right? They, they, they miss the real problems and, I, and they, they say that problems are somewhere else. And I think we'll start to think that that's true and, and 
why run the risk of bundling together the good parts like transparency, like more thinking, better thinking that, that might be encouraged by pre-registration? Why bundle that up with the stuff that could potentially cause harm when it can actually, if we can identify quite clearly what are the benefits um, and there are good reasons for them, why not try and have policies that are about those um, more specifically? Why bundle that up with the confirmatory exploratory stuff? Okay, so, so now I'll try. I'll try for 20, 25 or 30 minutes to convince you that, that exploratory confirmatory distinction doesn't make sense when it comes to testing theory. And to do that, we'll start with a very, very simple basic question, which is why do we expect things to happen? And I think it's, I don't know, it seems fair to say we expect things to happen because we have reasons. And as scientists, we hope that we have good reasons to expect things to happen. Because if we have good reasons, then the chances that what we expect to happen are, are higher, uh, will happen are higher. Right? And I think it's, it's easy to, or it's arguable that a bad reason to expect things to happen is just simply because they've happened before. And you know, there's, this is a very old um, argument, but I'll try and, try and just give you a nice little example to step through why I think this is the case. So imagine I tell you a person just walked past my office window. Uh, uh, I wonder if it'll happen again. Should I expect it to happen again? You can start to think about what your answer to that question would be. Uh, I suspect most people will, will come up with something maybe like, well, it's hard to tell, right? There's so many possible reasons that someone could walk past your window. Um, if they're going to work, then yeah, they might come back and they walk the same path back to home. Then they might pass, walk past your window again. If they're going to a restaurant, they might walk past your window again. They do this every day, like, right? It depends on the reasons. But the interesting thing, I think that this question, you can't even answer this question. I think what you have done in order to be able to answer that question is start to fill in the fact this question is so un underspecified, you've actually started to assume a whole bunch of things, right? So when I say, what does, when I say, should I expect it to happen again? What do I mean? Do I mean that same person will walk past my house? Do they have to walk from left to right like they did originally? Is it okay that they would walk from right to left? Do I just mean that person will walk past some other house? Do I mean that any person will walk past any house? Do I, do I mean this particular part of time, right? Like, in order to answer that question of whether something should happen, you, you have to start filling, it, filling in um, a bunch of gaps, essentially, in how I've specified the question with theory, background knowledge, some guesses as to what I'm talking about. And this, all of this is simply to say that basic, you know, all observations are theory laden. That, that sentence you probably heard somewhere in undergrad or in postgrad, and something you've read, right? Like ob all observations are theory laden. It, it depends on the explanation that you have. It depends on what you bring to the table as the researcher as well, right? And so what that all kind of means is that the only reason we have expectations is because we have reasons that, that motivate those expectations. And whether the future will look like the past is essentially a special case of one of those things, right? whether something will happen in the future and whether the future will look like the way it looked in the past is a consequence of a series of theoretical arguments or, or, or the consequence of a theory. And it doesn't make sense to supplement any existing theoretical structure with the general claim that the past will, the future will look like the past because that's already a problematic notion. There's no reason to expect, generally speaking, that the future will simply look like the past. So you wouldn't want to add that problematic conjecture just into any old theoretical system in order to make that be the prediction that it makes. The only reason you'd expect something to happen is because it's a consequence of your explanation or your theory for why things are happening in the first place. Right, so I think hopefully that's enough to, or, or enough to, to or you maybe just have to take it, um, that it's a bad reason to expect things to happen again just because they've happened before. So with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about what statistical inference is all about. And so it was fun. When I first made these slides, I was doing intro stats for undergrads and the lecture was on statistical inference and defining it. And it was great. It was, so what we do is we take our sample. We've got a population, something that we're interested in. We sample from that population. We measure something about that population. And then we say that that's true of the population uh, that we took the sample from. 
And then we get replication because if we sample from that population again, we should still we should see the same result. And this is very much in the limit on average, right? This is this is clearly there's noise, blah blah blah. But in the limit, this is what we trust to happen when we do statistical inference in the long run. And the argument for why confirmatory analyses are good and why they are more valid, provide more valid inferences, is the fact that when you take when you do a confirmatory analysis, you randomly sample from the population. You, you have put all these things in place, essentially, while you design your study, to randomly sample from that population. And what that means is that you should have a sample that's representative of the population. It has the same properties, on average, as the population about which you're trying to say things. And when you do a confirmatory analysis, you, 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 you make that representativeness um, a guarantee in the long run. And that's contrasted with something like exploratory analyses, where all of the things that you do as a biased researcher to censor data, to p-hack, to cut conditions out and so on, is to create a non-random sample from that population. And now you can't guarantee that the thing you have created, you took it, taken your random sample and you've chopped it up and so on, you can't guarantee that that is a random sample from any population because you've done a bunch of stuff to it. You've, you've ruined that random sampling process. And that means it doesn't generalize necessarily to any population, which means if you now resample from any population, you don't get the same stuff. And that's the, I think that's the statistical argument, or that's, I think, the bare bones at its core argument in statistical theory for why confirmatory analyses are to be prepared, preferred over exploratory analyses. But we have a problem here, which is that if we, Kind of examine the logic of how a statistical inference is made, we realize that it's because it happened before reasoning. When we sample from a population, we say something happens, it's true of some population, and then if we resample from that again, we'll get the same result. We are relying on it'll happen again because it happened before kinds of reasoning. Right? So statistical inference itself is problematic. In a vacuum, a statistical inference is, is a problematic kind of inference because it relies on this inductive reasoning. It relies on because it happened before reasoning. But that's fine because we don't use statistical inference like that. We embed our statistical inferences in scientific claims and scientific arguments. We don't expect in reality, because we sampled randomly, we will resample and we will produce the same results we have an explanation for why the original result happened. That explanation implies that these are the conditions under which we would expect to replicate the study. The, the theory motivates the, the reason for expecting replication, not this inductive reasoning. And so I would say we don't use statistics because they create valid inferences. We use them uh, because, because that would be flawed. If we were doing that, we would always be in trouble. Um, and there are certainly plenty of fields that you can look at where, where they run into exactly those kinds of problems that you'd anticipate. I would say in science, we use statistics because they're a tool that help us create good theories. They're a way of saying, well, if this theory is true, then this statistical analysis is what will show me what should happen according to this theory. And that allows us to say, well, yeah, that's consistent with what was expected. That's not consistent with what was expected. And that allows us to change and sculpt and abandon our theories. But for our purposes here, for the question of pre-registration, confirmatory, exploratory analyses, it, it, it means that we need not ask, how do we make sure our statistical inferences are valid? We need to ask, does the confirmatory exploratory distinction matter when we're talking about this idea of scientific argumentation or the, the, the position that statistical inference kind of sits in or the framework in which it sits? that where it's it's kind of wrapped around by some scientific argument um, in that situation does uh, does this distinction make sense or is it important right and i think the answer is no i think of course i'll try and convince you of that but and i think like there's there's lots of ways to do that this talk could go on for hours trying to do that i'll try and pick a couple of examples of where and and i'm going to start with this idea of that sort of core argument for the distinction between confirmatory and exploratory research. And so remember in, in, from a couple of slides ago, in statistical theory, we say inferences are valid because we have an unbiased sample from the population and confirmatory analyses 
are the things that help us get to no bias, this unbiased process, right? That random sampling process is what makes us be sure that we have a representative distribution or a representative sample from our population. But of course, there's when we, when we take, that's the statistical theory bubble, the virtual reality environment that we create that we call statistical theory. And then in practice, we have something that's nothing like that, right? We, we upload some money into, we give Amazon some money and then we pay them to get some people to do our experiments. Or we open up some slots on some kind of recruitment program and we, we run our experiment that way. We don't do this. I'm not even sure a physical process exists that is random sampling, right? There's, what we do is instead we pretend. We pretend like we can take a random unbiased sample from a population because some theory says we're allowed to. We, we say, well, based on all of our background knowledge, I've got these assumptions that I'm gonna make, and we're gonna pretend that that's essentially the way that we're gonna collect participants is equivalent to random sampling. Yes, we're taking a sample of a, a weird sample, um, the, an acronym weird, weird um, or an acronym, acronym, um, right? We're, we're, we're taking this particular kind of sample, but you know what, for the thing that I'm gonna talk about, for the claims that I'm gonna try and make within this theoretical framework, the, the fact that I've got this hugely restricted sample doesn't matter, it's okay. Everyone's vision is the same, um, speaking as a vision researcher. <laughs> um, so the theory lets us do that. And, and it's, it's similar, I think, in the way, right? Like this is analogous to, we do this stuff all the time. A coin toss is not a random process, but we pretend like it is because basically we say, well, the fixed in, the inputs to the system are suitably unpredictable that we can just pretend like a coin toss is a random process. Right? And it's the same thing we do when we, when we pretend like we're randomly sampling from a population and then we perform our statistical inference. But the clear thing there is that that, can, that part where it's confirmatory is, is not the bit that makes us allowed to pretend like we're randomly sampling. What lets us pretend like we're random sampling is not about confirmatory exploratory distinctions. It's about whether the theory is good. It's whether or not that's a reasonable set of assumptions to make. There's no problems with the assumptions that you're making that allow you to pretend like you're randomly sampling. And there's no good argument for why a theory would be good just because it's proposed before an experiment. Right? So this distinction between whether it was predicted or post hoc doesn't matter because it's not when, when you propose your theory doesn't tell you whether that theory is good or bad necessarily, right? And so that distinction fails the check of moving outside of statistical theory into scientific practice, I think, um, because it's not the fact that it's confirmatory that makes things unbiased. It's whether a theory implies that you can pretend like you have an unbiased random sample. So I think that's, that's probably one of the main, the, the real core argument as to, as to where you see that failure going from statistical theory to, to reality, to scientific practice. And I think there's, a, there's another interesting consequence of this too, which is, so if what matters is essentially, if a confirmatory analysis makes sense because the assumptions, the theory that motivates the confirmatory analysis is good and not problematic, an implication for that I think is that what your job as a researcher is to do is to, to do whatever you can, especially once data is collected, to try and find problems with that motivation. And I think what that means is that postdoc analyses, analyses that you do once the data has arrived, are if not more important than the confirmatory analyses, because if we're gonna make the distinction, because in order for the confirmatory analyses to make sense, there has to be no problems with what motivates them. And once you've done the experiment, you have more information and you have more potential problems with the motivation for that confirmatory analysis. And so your duty as a scientist, I would say, is to find in that data reasons to undermine your confirmatory analysis, right? And so I, it's sort of, I always get a little bit upset when I see things like, well, exploratory research is, is also allowed when you pre-register, it doesn't preclude pre-registration. And I think that to even start framing things that way to assume the, the increased validity of one kind of analysis over another is to completely misunderstand, I, I think, the role of data analysis in, in, in this kind of theory testing process. Because really all that matters is whether or not there are no problems with the overall argument that you're trying to make. 
or not that there are no problems, but the problems are clearly identified and, and, and discussed and posed and so on. Okay, so I think um, another, another sort of place where, another kind of argument that people make for, for confirmatory analyses um, where it makes sense in statistical theory but doesn't translate very well over into practice is that of error control, type one error control. Um, right, so the simulation studies that I talked about earlier that Simmons et al. do where, where you, you create some artificial environment where you randomly generate data, you carry out sequences of t-tests or, or analyses, and then you find that the probability of rejecting a null hypothesis increases far beyond what is, is implied by the, what, what is supposed to happen according to these error controls. And I think, again, if we ask what about that artificial environment how, how well does that map on to what is done in practice um, when, when trying to create scientific arguments um, or to test theories? I think it doesn't hold very well, right? I think that's a wonderful analogy for something like a production line, like where you have, you have a, the same process putting liquid into a, into a container that is being repeated over and over again you are randomly sampling glasses and asking is, is how much does that weigh? If, if the effect is, if there's a significant test, you say there might be something broken with my system. Like that kind of, that's a good analogy, right? There's then aspects of that artificial thing that you've created are like the physical process. But I, I don't feel like it maps very well onto what scientific practice looks like, where if I'm doing a, a postdoc analysis, I, I, I open up my data set, I look at the graphs of the first thing that I was going to do, and then I see problems or I, 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 I think harder and I realize like, oh, interesting, maybe if, shouldn't this be happening? If, if my explanation of what's going on is right, shouldn't this be happening? And then I open up a new part of the data and I plot that and I do a test to see whether or not there's, there's, there's good reason to think whether that's holding or not. If it doesn't work out, maybe I, I push a little bit harder. I, I say, oh, maybe it's because people weren't paying attention sometimes. So I then go back and look, well, how often was that happening? And right, it's this sequence of behaviors that are very targeted. They're motivated by some, the quest to try and entertain different theories, explanations for what's going on. That, none of, that doesn't sound very much like these sort of artificial environments that are created in, um, in these simulations. So I don't, think it makes a lot of sense to, to say that, well, the problems that exist in this world mean that we have problems with the way that we're doing our postdoc analyses and our exploratory analyses in practice, if they're done well. In fact, I would say that the lesson from these simulations, if there's to be one, um, is how easy it would be to fool ourselves if we were to mistake statistical inference for scientific argument. If we were to say that a p-value being less than 0.05 is the criterion for reality, or if we were to, to call, if we were to focus on identifying effects by virtue of their statistical significance, geez, it would be easy to, to fool ourselves if we were to take this approach. I think that's a wonderful lesson to learn from that simulation study. I don't think it then implies that the solution to the problem is to fix the statistical reasoning because that statistical reasoning is embedded within that scientific reasoning where you're trying to come up with an explanation for what has happened. Right? I'd say the lesson is don't turn your science into this production line. Do, do whatever you can to avoid making your science look like that. Have it look like where you're, you're, you're coming up with explanations for what has happened. You're entertaining the implications of those explanations. You're looking for reasons to find problems or to, to believe further what you're, what you're saying. Right? And that, that, but definitely don't do this other thing because it might have dramatic consequences, right? And so I just spend a couple more minutes talking about this, this idea because I, I want to spend a bit more talking about p-hacking. And, and before we do that, we should think about, I think, what, why do things fail to replicate, right? So imagine we're doing some big fishing expedition style exploratory analysis and we find these two variables, x and y, correlate. And then we run the study again, or our study again, and we fail to find a correlation between X and Y in a subsequent study. Right? And we might say, well, that was because the original result relied on some kind of biased p-value. And then you end up, you say that was a bad influence, and you end up saying confused, confused, confusing things like, well, the effect's not real, it's not reliable, it's not robust, right? And especially the effects not real is, is a confusing one. Like that 
it seems to be gaslighting reality or something, but because whatever happened, happened, right? You did observe a, a relationship between X and Y in the original study. What happened was your theory or your explanation for what happened was wrong. It was prob there's probably problems with your explanation, right? It's not necessarily the case, but it's probably the case that there are problems with your explanation. You were wrong about why X and Y were related. You couldn't recreate the environment sufficient to reproduce that relationship. Whatever other factors were causing X and Y to be correlated were gone in this, re in this other world that you've created, this other experiment, right? But it's not that the thing didn't happen, the facts aren't real, it's about the explanation being wrong. Right? And so and the reason I'm talking about that is because I think what that means or what I think the lesson from something like examining the problems with p-hacking should be about are not about failures to control type one error rates and so on. I think they are failures to come up with good explanations of what has happened in the first case, in the first experiment, let's say. All right, so, and I think then there are really two big problems to point out with p-hacking that they create. The first is that they let us ignore observations that might create problems for what we're trying to say. Right? When, we, when we design our study, we, we, we pick our dependent variables. We might have two dependent variables because we both think they are measuring the same basic construct. We have multiple conditions because we think that those conditions are somehow going to be relevant for the, the claims that we're going to try and make. Right? And when we p-hack, when we now analyze our data, pick out the significant effects and don't talk about the variables that, that fail to reach significance or don't, it, it, or when we sort of do the more egregious thing of dropping conditions that, are, that aren't significant, perhaps might be one reason. Another might be that you look at the results, you can't explain them and you drop them and hide them, the, the more sort of nefarious version of p-hacking. Right? Even if we do the, the more like innocent version of just failing to explain the relationships in, in, in conditions that, that, um, that don't fit with the explanation or haven't reached statistical significance, we might be creating problems because whatever explanation that we're going to try and come up with for why this dependent variable showed a significant effect of our manipulation. Okay, that's, that's great. You say, you give some explanation for why that's the case, but then it, it seems surprising then that whatever explanation you have for that effect on that dependent variable, also since these dependent variables are supposed to be measures of the same construct is not present in the other variable, right? It, it might be that there's a good explanation for why that's the case, but your job is to explain that, right? But by a, being able to, in p-hacking, ignore that other variable completely, either to put it out of the paper, to even if you report it, but just say, don't worry about it. Right. You are creating explanations that, and, and uh, you're creating explanations or theories that are inherently potentially already problematic. And then it's no wonder that you can't successfully or expect what is going to happen because you're, when you design your next study and you say, well, these are the things that are important. These are the factors that matter when we're reproducing this effect. You're wrong about them. It, it shouldn't be surprising because through p-hacking, and through ignoring observations that would help you rule out bad explanations or problematic explanations, you're, you're, you're creating bad expectations for future experiments. So I think the, the, the lesson from p-hacking is, uh, or from these simulation studies, I think, especially the one where there's multiple dependent variables or multiple conditions that you're dropping, is why, why do those observations not create, is there a chance that those observations create problems for what you're trying to say, or what you're trying to conclude? And again, just quickly, I don't think pre-registering any one of these analyses would prevent any of these problems. Right? If you're ignoring variables, it doesn't matter if you say you're going to ignore them ahead of time or not. What matters is whether there's a good reason to ignore them, right? That's, that's okay. If there's a theory that motivates the preference of one dependent variable or attention to one dependent variable over another, that, that makes sense. But then it's not the pre-registration that's done anything. It's the fact that some theory says that this is the dependent variable that's important. I've got some reason for doing that. I think the other, just the last, the last thing I'll spend a bit of time talking about is just, is that p-hacking also lends itself to ad hoc explanations or where you just say, well, essentially I think it's that sort of um, production line metaphor. You just start using statistical significance as 
the theory itself. It turns an effect on. We now say that effect is there and we don't bother providing an explanation for why that effect would be there in the first place. And the reason why I think that that's such a bad idea is so you observe some correlation between X and Y. The, and it's, it's kind of the similar to the example of the person walking past the front window. Now you say, well, should we expect to see that correlation again? Well, in the same way that because there were so many reasons someone could walk past my window, we can't really say with any confidence whether it will happen again. It's analogous for an ad hoc or letting ourselves have ad hoc explanations for observations like correlations between variables. It's so underdetermined that it's not clear what you should expect, why you should pick any one possible explanation and then test that in a replication study. It's not clear why that would be the case. What your, you know, what you should be trying to do is explain, start answering questions of how, why that correlation would exist, take seriously the implications of those explanations, look for other data that you have, look for other literatures um, that will help you determine whether or not those are reasonable things to say, reasonable claims to try and make, rule out explanations um, with your postdoc analyses, All right? And I think the, um, yeah, that the, the, that failing to do that is what leaves things undetermined and makes predictions bad, uh, predictions for future experiments bad. Um, God, something just keeps coming and going from, from my mind. Oh, it's also why I think the, we have the heuristic that a confirmatory analysis would be more useful than an exploratory one. I think that there, it, it's to do with this. It's because when we design a study, we, we are choosing our conditions, our, our, we are randomizing subjects, we are randomizing items to st conditions and so on. And we do this to rule out alternative explanations. Because if we've done this randomization, then, it, then it's no longer a good explanation to say that we've confounded this thing. And that's the reason that X and Y are related. And that's one reason that you might expect sort of like a correlation between confirmatory research and good theories or good tests. But again, it's not, it's not a necessary relationship. It's a, it's a relationship that you have to go looking, you have to understand the theory, you have to, in order to tell, you can't just tell it just because it's confirmatory, then you have all of these things in place. And again, kind of same deal, like pre-registration doesn't fix this stuff. You can do all of this stuff pre-registered or not. Um, I was gonna spend some time talking about flexibility, but I just, I'm gonna stop instead because I clearly rambled on for too long. But there's, there's psychonomics uh, in a couple of weeks and my, I've got a psychonomics talk that's all about flexibility um, and prediction, not pre-registration, but you can kind of treat them as interchangeable. Um, and it's all about the sharpshooter example. Um, and it's all about how thinking about that sharpshooter fallacy and flexibility of, of the explanations you might have for why that person is hitting targets and not, um, and how none of that is fixed by simply having predictions. Because the, the short story is that pr failed predictions only matter if your theory, if, there's, if th that creates a problem with your theory, but flexible theories can't be made problematic by failed predictions. They're in, they're, they're, they're protected from that kind of by definition. Um, and you might argue that, that well, that's the reason the pre-registration is useful because it, it highlights, it helps us see this flexibility. Um, but again, that's not a general property. That's, it's, it tells us that there's a failed prediction, but it doesn't tell us if it's a, a, you know, if the theory is good or bad, it doesn't tell us anything more specifically in order to make that judgment and that diagnosis you have to know what it is to be a good theory or a bad theory. You have to be able to understand why, what flexibility is problematic and what is not. And that's why we say the pre-registration pre part is completely redundant right, in, the, in our original title, because you have to know all that stuff about evaluating theories and then the pre-registration becomes unnecessary and the prediction part becomes unnecessary. But yeah, that's it. That's, that's, you said you were gonna cut me off at 10 too, so I'll stop. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for cutting yourself off. And everyone, um, you know, yeah, so everyone's going to be showing you little claps, hopefully. Those are, those are the, uh, <laughs> uh, it's not quite as good as hearing claps, but, you know, uh, there we I'll go. Uh, there was a comment in the chat. I don't know if, Ron, you wanted to expand on that. Um, oh, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, Ron, go ahead. And then after that, we can just, if you have a question, just speak up. Yeah, it, uh, it seems to me that uh, there are some more compelling reasons that pre-registration is a problem. 
One of them is that I think it creates a real incentive to create poorly thought through pre-registered analyses and pre-registered plans, which actually allow you to avoid doing things like uh, testing uh, competing alternative hypotheses, because then you say in the paper, well, we couldn't do that because we hadn't pre-registered. And I have seen examples of that. So it, it really can be quite nefarious where it actually allows you to stop being exploratory, stop looking at your things. The other area in which it's particularly pernicious is if your primary hypothesis is disconfirmed and you have secondary uh, uh, hypotheses which are pre-registered, they often don't make sense and you need to be doing completely different kinds of analyses to try and understand why your uh, primary hypothesis has been disconfirmed. And again, the pre-registration, particularly when it pushes people to not being able to report or being treated as second rate, anything that's not pre-registered, actually creates a, a, a real problem in terms of people trying to understand what's happening. And uh, you know, I'm involved in one example where the journal will not accept non-pre-registered uh, analyses uh, in a case where the primary hypothesis failed. Uh, it's just ridiculous. Yeah, right. I, I think those are, are, are good. They're, they're kind of like specific, I would take those as specific examples of, I think the, the, um, the consequence of taking it perhaps too seriously. Um, yeah, we, we, I, of course, like tried to, because I think like one of, one of the, what I would say is that, well, then if, if, if you were a proponent or an, going to argue in favor of pre-registration, in that case, you could say, well, those are bad actors and it's very hard to protect against bad actors with any kind of policy. And we just put the policy in place, but then what people do with it. Um, but I think that's, that's where I, I had a slide earlier, the bundle, the bundling problem is that, again, I think that that most, uh, let's even imagine that most people that argue in favor of pre-registration wouldn't be as silly as to make the mistakes in your example. But again, I think that nuance gets lost over time. And as uh, th what you're worried about, I, I, this is, again, it's speculation, right? It's, it's, you can't be sure of any of this, but that's, those are examples of what I would worry about as being the consequence of having something that just kind of gets it wrong. Um, in place and elevated to that status that, that other good things like open data, reproducible results, transparency in, in important ways. Uh, yeah. But they, these are examples, these are real examples. They're not oh, yeah. hypothetical examples, uh, uh, Chris. And I wonder if it relates to what's pre-registered. I think there's a much stronger case for pre-registering your hypotheses. Uh, pre-registering uh, methods and analyses, I think are much uh, likely to be much more problematic. Yeah, I mean, methods, in a sense, writing your method section before you run the study is fine. Um, saying that there's any increased validity to an analysis simply because you've said you were going to do it before you do it doesn't. There's no good argument for that. I think that's the kind of point of the talk. Yeah. So I've got uh, a question here um, from Piers. Uh, okay. so, yeah. Chris, I, I loved your talk. Um, I, I'm going to take issue with just one part of it. I can very much see that you would sometimes have a really clear-cut theory which makes really clear-cut predictions, at which point the concept of pre-registration goes out of the window. It's like, this theory predicts X. Did you or did not observe X? It's, it's, you're done. Yeah. The problem, and I, I'm not going to name names here, but I've worked with people who are very, very good at producing post-hoc theories. So after the event, they can produce a theory, computational model, which can only predict what was observed. And then they claim, this, this, is, this is it. And they claim to have done all your stuff. Um, and, they're, and, they're, and they are, these particular individuals were harking on, I, I, I'm assuming you don't know any of them, um, harking on and um, saying, look, it's a very strong prediction of my theory. And they put a lot of effort into generating this theory. And the thing with pre-registration is it can just show that that's not true. Because if their theory really was that strong, they would make the prediction in advance and they can't. And so it just, it saves a lot of time. So in I don't those think it instances, does. I think it's useful. You yeah, don't? no, no, no. I, I, this, this is a, like, it's a, it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. What, yeah. but I think it also, um, 
what it, what it, what it does is it says pre-registration is useful because it shines a light on, yeah. uh, on the, like on the flexibility of an explanation. Right. But like, you know, theory change is part of science, right? F predictions fail. You change theories in, in response to those. And really there's, there's sort of, there's good and bad kinds of flexibility, yeah. right? There's, 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 there's the, what you're worried about is the case where what you just described was possible no matter what happened, right? No yeah. matter what observation happened, it was possible to change that theory, that computational model to nail whatever exactly happened. And doing yeah. that doesn't, doesn't give the theory any problems with what it said before either, right? Like that, and the, those theories are just themselves a waste of time. It's not that, yeah. right? Uh, but the properties of that theory, that the, the ability to do that to a theory is a property of the theory. It's not a property of, um, it's, it's, something that, uh, it's something that we can know about before we run studies and do pre-registrations, right? Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's something that we can, if we are on the lookout for that, if we become, if we boost our knowledge in terms of our understanding of what it is to be a good or bad theory, then we can see these things coming from a mile away. And I would argue there's plenty of demonstrations where pre-registration has done very little to control that, like the big large scale replications where they, they make very, everyone agrees, this is what the theory predicts, right? And then, then hundreds of labs collect data, tens of thousands of participants are made to do some study. And at the end of the study, it doesn't work out, but it's fine. The theory's fine. It's okay. It was this other thing that we didn't, ah, oh, it's okay. Nothing is compromised. It's all changed, right? Like, I, I, and I don't think the pre-registration was necessary in order, and the pre-registered big study was necessary in order to demonstrate that. If we, if we just sat down with the theory and says, what is, it, what, what is it saying right now? What has it said before? What has happened before? Has this theory not tangled itself in a web and collapsed already? do we need that one more study, right? I think we could just spend a bit more time um, before we run those, run those studies and, and use this sort of more inefficient way of, maybe that one more study will break it. It's like, well, none of the other ones have. Why should we expect this one to? <laughs> it's 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 whether you, it's whether you can agree if you're being reasonable. You, you can just, you can, it's, it's politics. It's like, no, no, my theory is firm. And then it's like, well, what's your prediction? And, oh, actually, I can't give you a prediction. Well, then it's not firm. It just brings okay. things to light easier. But it's politics. Uh, but anyway, yeah. next. Yeah. So, sorry, I just Slide. wanted to, we have a very interesting question from Samin in chat. She said she's got a, a lot of noise. So um, I'll try to, I'll just, I'll read it out. Um, uh, but I'd love to hear your, your, your view on this, Chris. Um, uh, I think which is, it's a bit more about sort of, uh, the what's an appropriate policy from like the an, an editor type perspective um uh and so she says this i think it's reasonable uh for an editor to insist that non-pre-registered results should not be presented with the same certainty as pre-registered results especially if the pre-registered analyses produce negative results and the non-pre-registered ones present positive results given what we know about motivated reasoning and so forth of course, it would not be reasonable for an editor to ask the authors not to report the non-pre-registered results at all, but if what the editor is doing is insisting they be flagged and that those conclusions not place as much weight on those results, then I think that's defensible editorial practice. So I guess that's the sort of question, yeah. Um, yeah. Given the motiv motivated reasoning issue, um, what would you, yeah, how would you? So I would say motivated reasoning is, is, is always a play. Like when you design the study, you've, the motivated reasoning thing has started. We can't protect against that. I think we just have to roll in to that. That's like a, it's a necessary consequence of science. We're all motivated. And because it, like, it's, it's, it's similar to that example, right? With the person walking past the window. Once we've, once we've viewed our question, even from our own theoretical lens, it's everything we do is a consequence of that, right? So all the choices that we make in designing our studies. But I would say like the, the, the argument there, what I'd say what an editor should be asking for is not that you would place less weight or less certainty or something like that on the outcome of this particular statistical inference because this one was protected by being confirmatory and this one was, is just exploratory. Um, that doesn't, I think that's, that's kind of like what I was trying to talk about with, um, with confirmatory and exploratory analyses, not really translating. 
what I would say in that case is the editor should ask them, can you please, whatever you're saying, whatever explanation you're giving for the non-pre-registered results, please explain why the pre-registered analysis turned out this way. Does that not create any problems for what you're trying to say? Right? Um, because, yeah, I, I think this is, we, it's problematic to think about um, certainties or validities or credences being attached to effects. Um, so just just because something was significant or not, or it's more, it's better, it's more improved just because it was pre-registered, I think is to take far too seriously the, the statistical inference machinery. Right? And rather what you should be asking, I guess, people to do is explain what happened. Um, yeah, that, that, to reframe that in terms of, of my talk, I guess. Cool. So I really hate to say this because this is a super interesting discussion, but it is now 101 and <laughs> it is incumbent on me to say that, um, that <laughs> that's the yeah. end so that everyone can uh, go on to all their other Zoom meetings. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but thanks so much, Chris, for coming and uh, chatting. It was really um, very interesting as I totally expected. And thank you everyone for your uh, attention and questions. Yeah. Um, thanks everyone. Uh, and yeah, um, Chris, have a look in chat before you leave yep. it if you can. Um, uh, but thank you very much. Yeah. Um.